Hi guys, in this video we are going to continue on the organic chemistry and uh, last time in the previous video we talked about the organic synthesis basically we discussed all those chemical reactions and how we can make use of those reactions to convert uh, a compound A into compound B right? and last time we focused on the reactions but of course, if we really want to carry out those conversions, that means if we really want to prepare uh, compound B from compound A, uh, we are not only simply carry out the reaction and that's that. Because the products that we form from the reactions are not pure, right? They may be mixed with the unreacted reagents, maybe mixed with the byproduct, something like that. So if you really want to uh, prepare compound B, then after those reactions, we still have to think about steps to separate the product from the other chemical species and we also have to think about steps to purify it, okay? So that would be our today's focus, how to separate, how to purify it, okay? So here, laboratory preparation of simple carbon compounds. Now, in fact, the preparation of compounds, uh, we did talk about that in Form 4. But in Form 4, we are talking about preparation of salt. Right? Preparation of salt. So here, we are doing something similar. Now, first of all, in chemistry, preparation actually means to produce the product, but we also make sure the product is dry and pure. Okay? Product. Okay? Not simply reacts to form the product, but we also want the product to be dry and pure. Okay? So, like in Form 4, whenever we have to prepare a substance, we must have three stages. First of all, the reaction, okay, to generate the product. Now, the product that is produced after the reaction, we call them crude product. Uh, crude product. So crude product means impure product, okay? Like I said, it is often mixed with the unreacted reagents and solvents and byproducts, etc. So that's why we need the, third, the second stage, which is the separation. The separation aims to separate our products from the rest of the chemicals, so we get a more pure product. And at the end, we try to purify it, purify it. So even we separate them from uh, the rest of the chemicals, very often we can only separate most of them, but there should be still remain together with the product. So in order to get a pure product, we need to do purification to further get rid of the um, other chemical reagents, chemical species. Also, purification also emphasizes on drying, okay, because very often the product is not dry, uh, it has some water trapped inside, so we need to also think about how to get rid of, get rid of those water. Okay, so that's the idea. Now here, uh, before we actually talk about some case studies, actually we have two case studies, which are the classic ones. Uh, before we talk about those uh, case studies, there is one very important separation technique that we need to learn. Um, now speaking of separation technique, actually we did learn about some since Form 1. Uh, we learned about filtration, evaporation, distillation, fractional distillation, crystallization. Now all these are separation techniques and some of those are still using in Form 5 in DSC chemistry. Um, but here this is just to provide you another, another tool for separation. Now here, this is called liquid liquid extraction. Liquid liquid extraction. So, by the name, you can tell it involves two liquids, right? It involves two liquids. So, um, here, this is the, uh, the meaning of liquid-liquid extraction. It is used to separate solutes from a solution. Uh, I, I make a mistake here, so please correct it. Let me make it a little bit bigger. So, it is used to separate solutes from a solution and we separate them based on their, their solubility, okay? Solubility towards two different solvents, okay?
okay? So you see here, we did provide two solvents, so two liquids. And basically, we provide two solvents for the solute to choose, to choose which one to dissolve in, all right? So you will expect the solute will dissolve in the solvents that it has the highest solubility towards, right? So by providing two different solvents, we can have most of the solute ends up in one solvent, while only small amount of the solute ends up in the other solvent. And at the end, we just simply uh, get rid of the solvent with very few products, and we collect the solvent with the majority of the product, and then this is how we can achieve the separation. Well, does it clear? Probably not. So let me just show you this example, and also show you uh, this new glassware, new apparatus. Okay, now here, first of all, what are we going to do? We are going to separate bromine from bromine water. So we have a bromine water, and we want to get the bromine out of bromine water. So that's the, that's the objective. So to do that, we are going to have this apparatus. This is what we call a separating funnel, a separating funnel. Okay, separating funnel. Now, this is the thing. This is a separating funnel. Okay, this is a separating funnel. Can you see the resemblance? Um, you see, let me put it this way, right? You see, um, maybe closer to you. You see, it has a, uh, it has this uh, like round fat part, and we have a nozzle here. And we have a valve, right? We have a valve here where we can rotate it to open and close it. And we also have a cap, open and close, okay? Now, this one, I will show you how to do it uh, after we discuss this part. We actually have a demonstration. Um, so don't worry, I will come back to this later. Now, if you go back to the diagram, so the first step is we will add, we will add the bromine water Make it a little bit bigger. We will add the bromine water into the flask and we also add hexane. Okay, hexane. So hexane is an organic solvent. Like I said, this separation technique requires two different solvents. So here, water is a solvent, hexane is a solvent. Let's put it down. So water is a solvent and it is obviously a very polar solvent. Okay, very polar solvent. And hexane, on the other hand, is a very non-polar solvent. Okay? Now, usually, we choose two solvents with extremely different polarity. So one is polar, another one is non-polar. It's quite meaningless to have two polar solvents and two non-polar solvents because what we try to do is to separate the solute based on their solubility. So of course we are choosing two distinctively different solvents so that the solute can make a better decision. Okay, where to dissolve the most into, right? So now we are provided with two solvents. Now, according to your uh, chemistry knowledge, for bromine, which one does it dissolve more? Is it water or hexane? Of course, the majority of the bromine should end up in the hexane. Okay, so you will expect to see a lot of bromine here, but just small amount of bromine here. Okay, do you agree? Because bromine is also non-polar, and you know like this of like, like this of like. So bromine is non-polar, it prefers the non-polar solvent to polar solvent. That makes a lot of sense, okay? So once you mix it together, now the next step is we need to shake it. We need to shake the solvents, shake everything, okay? Now why do we have to shake it? Well, the reason is because, you know, hexane and water does not mix together. They are immiscible, okay? So in fact, you should expect to see uh, the hexane layer at the top, the water layer at the bottom, okay? And the two layers does not mix. So, in other words, the bromine is not 
totally exposed to both solvents. So it takes a long, long, long time to achieve the separation. So what we're going to do here is we try to shake everything so that the bromine salt solute is exposed to two solvent molecules thoroughly so that it can make a better decision. It can make the separation much, much, much faster. Okay, so that's why we need to uh, shake it. Okay, so now when we shake it down here, we shake the mixture and then we vent it occasionally. Now, vent it basically means you actually open up the valve. Now, like I said, the valve, there is a valve here to open the, uh, the, the nozzle, okay? Um, because think about it, when you shake it, the hexane is very volatile. It's very volatile. When you shake it, you provide uh, extra kinetic energy to the hexane molecules, so they were more likely to vaporize to form hexane vapor. Now, when you get more hexane vapor inside the separating funnel, then the pressure goes up, and there is a chance where the, um, the, the, the lid, the cap, get popped out. If it popped out, then the liquid all fall out, splash into your hand, not a good idea, especially considering bromine is extra toxic, okay? So that's why you need to vent it. You open up the nozzle a bit, release and equalize the pressure, and then you shake it again, all right? So we vent it to release pressure. Okay, and after that, we let it stand still. We let it stand for a while. <clears throat> when you let it stand for a while, then the two layer will be separated. Okay, hexane at the top, water at the bottom. Now you can see here, the hexane layer is having a very high color intensity. It has a very deep orange color. So you know bromine in hexane layer is having an orange color. So that means the majority of the bromine has already dissolved it in the hexane layer. Now the water layer, you see, is a pale orange or pale brown. So the reason why is because no matter uh, how the bromine uh, prefers hexane, there are still some bromine, there is always some bromine dissolved it in water layer. So it gives a little brown color, but it doesn't really matter because the majority of bromine is here. Okay? So, we allow it to stand until two layers are separated and then what we're going to do next is we try to remove or drain away the water layer. We don't want the water layer so we open up the valve, let it drain out and actually that water fraction or water layer, uh, you can discard it, you can pour it away or you can actually keep it for a second separation, for a second separation because this one still contains some bromine amount you can actually do another separation with another uh, uh, fresh hexane. You can further extract the re remaining bromine here. But it is your choice whether or not you want to do a second a separation. The majority is we want to have this layer collected. Okay? Now just one more thing. When you open the valve and let the aqueous layer drain out, make sure you open the cap. Make sure you open the cap. Otherwise, the liquid will not fall down because the pressure, the atmospheric pressure, prevented it to fall down, okay? It's a form one science. So now that would be the idea. That would be the idea, okay? Now, um, down here, so basically what I said earlier, bromine is nonpolar. Therefore, it has a high affinity towards the nonpolar solvent, such as hexane. Now you see here, we have a word called affinity. Actually, it appears here already when we talk about the technique. Now, affinity in Chinese, okay, right, basically means solubility, okay, solubility. But uh, because separation technique does not only apply to liquid, uh, sometimes it applies to solid as well, or even gas. Uh, in those cases, we are seldom using solubility. So um, affinity is more of a uh, general term. Uh, make sure you know the meaning, and probably it would be best if you can use uh, this word as well to, to explain how the separation works. Okay? So that's the idea. Uh, going down here, so like I said, bromine prefer non-polar sulfur such as hexane, 
Now, actually, there are more choices of non-polar solvents. Hexane is one of them. Another one is ether. Another one is called halo alkanes. For ether, usually we go for diethyl ether. Diethyl ether. So the structure is like this. Diethyl ether. Okay. Uh, for halogenal alkane, or halo alkane, usually we go for CCL4 or uh, chloroform. These are good choices. Okay. All right. And there is also one uh, you may see it from the DSC, which is called water cell two four four. I, I forgot it's two four four two two four. I forgot water cell two four four. Now you can just think about this one as another organic solvent. Okay. Just another organic solvent. Okay, we call water seal two four four. Should be capital letter. Okay. So uh, that's the idea. Now, go back to here. This one, the hexane layer. Once you are collected, then you're supposed to have only the hexane and the bromine, right? But in reality, you still got some water there. You still got some water staying in the hexane layer because just now you just shake it around and. There might be some water uh, still staying together with the hexane layer. So after we collect the hexane layer, actually we need to remove the residual water. Remove the residual water. Okay. So to remove the residual water, we will use a drying agent, a drying agent such as anhydrous calcium chloride or anhydrous magnesium sulfate. So we add it in, so they will remove that water. Then we will only have the hexane and the bromine. So you can get rid of this uh, drying agent by a filtration, and then after that, you will usually distill off the hexane to collect the solute. You will distill the hexane uh, so that you collect the, uh, the solute or your target product. Okay, so that's the idea. That's the idea. Now, just one more thing before I do a demonstration is that. Uh, when it comes to the choice of solvents, the choice of solvents, let me put it down here. Choice of solvent. Okay, especially the organic solvent. Now, there are some criteria when it comes to the choice of solvent. First of all, the solvent must be unreactive. Well, that makes a lot of sense because you don't want the solvent to react with your product, right? It will just complicate the, the separation. The second one is um, the solvent must be uh, very volatile or having low boiling point. Because like I said, after all the separation, after you remove the residual water, the last step is to distill off the solvent and collect the solute. But if your solvent is having a high boiling point, it will be more complicated, it will be more inconvenient to separate it. Okay, so make sure you find a volatile low boiling point. In that regard, ether is a very good choice because ether, the boiling point is talking about 30 something degrees Celsius, 30 something or 20 something. So this one is very, very volatile, very easy to remove. Okay, you can simply use a 30, 40 degrees Celsius water bath, you are already able to distill it off. And uh, the third one, of course, it must be immiscible. Immiscible. Okay? So the two solvents, okay, the water and the hexane must be immiscible. You, you won't choose hexane and ether. It doesn't make sense because it's just mixed together. Then you cannot have two layers. You cannot have two layers. Okay? So that's the idea. And uh, yeah, one last one last remark. Uh, most of the time, most of the time, the organic solvent is at the top. Usually, organic solvent is less dense than water, with one exception, which is halo alkanes. Okay, halo alkanes like CCl4 uh, and chloroform. These two, you can add a remark. Uh, you can use the black one here. These two are denser than water. 
they're denser than water. So if you put them, put the water together with halo alkanes into uh, uh, the separating funnel, you will expect to see the bottom layer being the organic solvent. Okay, so uh, that's the idea. All right, let's go to a demonstration. Let's go to a demonstration. Okay, that should do it. Okay, so uh, first of all here, uh, stand with uh, with the rain, okay, with the rain, and then our separating funnel over here. So this ring is used to hold the separating funnel in place. Very uh, convenient. Now, uh, what we're going to do is we have here. This is iodine solution. Iodine solution. I don't use bromine because it's too toxic. So this one is an iodine solution. And again, my objective is to get the iodine. Uh, we want to separate the iodine from the iodine water, iodine solution. Okay, and we want to separate them using. This one, hexane, okay, and hexane, okay. Now, the first step is we open up the lid and make sure, okay, the the valve is closed, okay. Make sure the valve is closed. Uh, the valve is closed when the handle is perpendicular to the nozzle, perpendicular. If the handle here is parallel, is parallel. To the to the nozzle, then it is open. So make sure it is horizontal. Uh, sorry, perpendicular. And then we add the um, bromine water. Here is around. Now here we have like eighty. I don't think we need that much. Uh, let's just pour maybe uh, fifty. I don't want to get too much. Right. This is. I think it's around forty. Okay. Then the rest I just put it away. Now we're gonna add hexane, okay? The hexane. So for the hexane, we will pour it around um, equal volume, around similar volume, like 40, okay? So um, I should use a measuring cylinder, but uh, well, anyway, I just use a beaker. It doesn't have to be very accurate. And here you see hexane, the bottle, even you open up the cap. There's still a little rubber stopper here because hexane is highly volatile. That's why this one to prevent it from leaking to the air. Okay, just pour like third, uh, 40. Just pour it in. A little more. It's getting so smelly here because this one is very volatile. So supposedly we should do this in the film cupboard, um, but yeah. Anyway, so now after that, so we need to shake it. Actually, you see here. Before I shake it, you see already we have two layers. We have two layers. Okay. Now we need to shake it. Now, how do we shake it? First of all, um, if you are right-handed, use your palm, the right hand palm. You try to put the stopper against your palm, and then you flip it like this. Okay. You flip it like this. Okay. So, and then the rest of the finger hold the body of the of the separating funnel. This is to prevent the stopper from popping out if the pressure inside gets too high. Okay? And then the left hand, which is used to hold the valve. Okay? And then when you shake it, you do it like this. One, two, three, okay? And then you release the pressure. Now, let me do it again closer. So shake, and you open it. Now, can you see the liquid here? Little brown liquid here. Now the liquid here, they enters to the nozzle. They enter to the nozzle because of the pressure inside that pushes some of the liquid to here. Uh, 
uh, and you can actually see that moving as I release the pressure again. Okay, not much now. Okay. So that's why we need to release the pressure. Okay, so that should do it. Now I'm just going to put it back to the ring and uh, you should find yourself a new beaker. Okay, and then we can put it back and then we allow it to stand for a while. Uh, when the two layers separated, then we can discard the water layer. But actually, you see. It is already separated into two layers, right? So actually now we can release um, the liquid. Now when we release the liquid, uh, you see now this is a wrong uh, demonstration. If you just open the valve, okay, it falls down a bit, but it doesn't fall. Now this is a common mistake because a lot, of, a lot of the time you forget to remove the, the lid. That's why the liquid doesn't fall out. But once you remove the lid, remove the lid, you see they start to fall down. Okay. Now you may ask, hey, when should I stop? When should I stop? Um, usually we will focus on here. Okay. Get a little bit closer. Hey. Usually, we will focus on this part. Now you see it is still uh, a little bit brown in color. Ah, by the way, speaking of colors, you see now the aqueous layer is brown in color. Uh, not as brown as before. You see before it's like this, right? Not as brown as before because the majority of the uh, aldine has moved to the hexane layer. And you see the hexane layer is what? Purple in color, right? Um, you know hexane has a purple color Sorry, uh, aldine has a purple color in hexane. Okay, so please remember those colors. Okay, now so we try to discard the um, the aqueous layer. We are looking at this part, this part of the uh, funnel. So usually we will sacrifice some hexane. We don't want much of the residual water. Instead, we will sacrifice some hexane so that we ensure the water is all drained out. Okay? Now you see, here, um, if you stop it here, then yes, the majority of the water does already in the, in the north, uh, I mean most of the water is still is already gone, but you still see some brown liquid here. So if you later on drain this one into a new beaker, then this residual water will end up in that, uh, in that uh, beaker. So that's why you should also drain away this part of the solution, of the water. Okay? So until it all becomes purple, right? So now it should only contain the hexane plus some residual water. Okay? So we did sacrifice a little bit of the hexane, but okay, that's the best we can do. So this one, we can take it away. Now again, like I said, this one you see, still pretty brown in color, right? You see, um, this one is still a little bit brown in color, so we can uh, consider doing another separation with this uh, fraction, so we can get more and more of this out in. Or you can say, okay, it's enough, so I will be, I will be getting this uh, out in. That would be already enough. Then the next step is you want to drain it into a beaker containing drying agent, anhydrous calcium chloride or anhydrous magnesium sulfate. You dry it, you do a filtration, and then you do a distillation to get rid of the hexane. Then you will have the out in. You will have the out in. Okay, so that's the demonstration. Okay.
Okay, so uh, now I think you will understand more about uh, liquid liquid extraction. So now let's look at some case studies. Some case studies. Okay. Now the first one here. What we are trying to do is we try to prepare uh, ethanoic acids and ethyl ethanoate. First of all, we prepare ethanoic acid, and in case study B, we will prepare uh, the ester. Okay, so we prepare ethanoic acid from ethanol. Now the reaction you should have already learned it. We will perform uh, an oxidation with an oxidizing agent. Very often, uh, potassium dichromate, acidified potassium dichromate solution. So and we need to make sure we need to heat it under reflux. So this is the uh, setup. Should not be new to you. Okay. And after that, we need to do separation. But before we think about how to do a separation, we need to make sure we know what are we having in the resulting mixture. What are we having in the resulting mixture? So in the resulting mixture here, now at the end, after the reactions, this is what we have. We should have our product, ethanol acid. Lah. We must have water lah, because um, the dichromic solution, we have water inside. And the dichromic has already uh, reacted and reduced it into chromium-3 ions. And we also have some unreacted potassium dichromic. We also have some ethanol, actually. We also get some ethanol. Actually, we don't because we add excess potassium dichromic. So the ethanol theoretically should all be reacted to ethanol acid. So there should, there should be no ethanol. Okay. Now, again, our target is this guy. Our target is this guy. So we want to separate the rest of them. Now, to do that, it's not too difficult. We can simply do a distillation because ethanol acid and water they have lower boiling points. 100 degrees Celsius and 180 degrees Celsius, and these two actually uh, have much higher boiling points. Actually, they don't boil at all. They are they are salts. They dissolve the salt. So we can heat the mixture, and then we can get an aqueous solution of ethanol acid. Okay, aqueous solution of ethanol acid. Okay, and then we can do another distillation to get the pure ethanol acid. Okay, we can redistill again to get um, the ethanol acid. Okay, so distillation is always a useful method to separate. But uh, this is only one way of doing this. Actually, if you are smart, you can make use of the liquid-liquid extraction, the one that we have just learned. Okay, um, because here, ethanol acid, even though it is very polar, it is less polar than the rest of this water, chromium 3 plus potassium dichromate. You may consider doing the solvent solvent, uh, the liquid liquid extraction using an organic solvent, okay, to get the benzoic, uh, sorry, the ethanol acid out, okay. Now, so this case study is easy, it's not too difficult, okay. Now, here. This is more important, part B, the case study B. This is more important. I will put a star here. Because it's much more complicated. Now, first of all, what are we going to do is we want to prepare ethyl ethanoate and ester from ethanol and ethanol acid. So this is a esterification reaction. Okay? So first step, the first stage, of course, is the reaction. We perform an esterification. We basically add the ethanol, ethanol acid, remember that catalyst, corn sulfuric acid, uh, we all put it inside a, a pure shade flask and then we heat it under reflux. Okay? Now here, remember the reaction is reversible. It's reversible. That means even though you heat it for a long time, even though you add excess reagent, the resulting mixture will contain our ester, ethanol, ethanol acid. So we still got the two reactants. Okay? Because it's reversible. So when we think about a separation, again, like I said, you need to focus on what do we have in the resulting mixture. Okay? Now, I have already listed out for you. <coughs> we have 
ethyl ethanoate, ethanol, ethanol acid, corn, sulfuric acid, water. Okay, now here, I just want to look at these things. Okay, now this is our target. This is our target. Okay, and among this, you realize that ethyl ethanoate is the uh, most nonpolar. Most nonpolar. I will put it this way. Most nonpolar. Right? Ethanol, ethanol acid, these two, even though they are organic compounds, but they are pretty polar itself. And of course, corn sulfur acid water, they are they are polar, very polar. <coughs> so here we may consider using a, a liquid liquid extraction, making use of the polarity difference. Okay, later on we will talk about it. Now here, because you see the separation here, we have three steps, three process. So first of all, we do a uh, distillation. We can do a distillation. Now because uh, the ethyl ethanoate and ethanol, they have lower boiling point than water. Then when we undergo distillation, we will have a mixture of actually uh, ethanol and ethanoic acid. Sorry, uh, ethanol and ethyl ethanoate. So here we should have ester and ethanol. But again, you may still get some ethanol acid, you may still get some water, you may even get corn sulfuric acid, right? But they will be small amount only. Mainly this two. Okay, mainly this two. Okay? So of course we need to have further separation. Okay, we cannot stop here. Okay. So the next step is we try to do a liquid liquid extraction. Liquid liquid extraction. So first of all, this is our distillate. So just now we say that we have a lot of ester, we have a lot of ethanol, probably we have some ethanol acid and water. Okay? So we need to carry out a liquid liquid uh, extraction. So here we will use uh, an aqueous solution here. But you see, this is not just water. It is actually sodium carbonate solution. Now the reason why we add sodium carbonate solution, you will be able to tell later. When you add it inside, actually there is a chemical reaction taking place. This chemical reaction between sodium carbonate and ethanol acid, right? It's an acid carbonate reaction. So when we add this one in, you should see a lot of bubblings, a lot of bubblings. Uh, when the ethanol acid reacts with the sodium carbonate, okay? So, and then we do the shaking, right, the venting, and then let it stand still. Now, at the top here, we should have the organic layer. The organic layer should contain mostly our ester, our ester product, and then the ethanol, probably dissolved in it as well. And down here, if I magnify it, we should have some of the remaining sodium carbonate, but we also have this one. Okay, this one is the sodium ethanoate. Sodium ethanoate because the reaction between ethanol acid down here, ethanol acid and sodium carbonate, okay, they generate a salt. This is a salt, right? Carbon dioxide and water. Now carbon dioxide will be uh, escaped from the uh, container. Water obviously ends up in the water layer, and the salt here because this is an ionic salt it will obviously dissolve uh, almost 100% in water, okay? So actually, now you know why we have to add sodium carbonate at the first place. Because we try to add sodium carbonate so that we can react the ethanol acid to form a water-soluble salt. This is to remove the ethanol acid uh, from the mixture. This is to remove the ethanol acid from the mixture, okay? So that's why at the top here, we should only expect to have ethanol and our target ester. Always remember, this is our target. Okay? So of course, we will drain away, we will, we will discard the aqueous layer, and then we, all, we collect the organic layer, which is having ethanol and ester. Okay? So now, we keep separating the stuff, now we only end up with two things, ethanol and the ester. Now, you may think, hey, we can do a distillation. We can do a distillation. 
But if you remember, ethanol has a boiling point of 78 degrees Celsius, ethyl ethanol 77 degrees Celsius. So the boiling point is very close. Even if you use fractional distillation, it's not that desirable. So that's why over here, we will have one more step, which is to add the organic layer this time. It is only the ester and ethanol. We will add it into excess calcium chloride. Calcium chloride. Okay, it will be best to highlight these special chemical. So the calcium chloride has another reaction that is exclusively towards the ethanol. Actually, calcium chloride reacts with ethanol to form a water-soluble calcium ethanol complex. Anyway, it forms something water-soluble. So basically, it will trap all the ethanol inside the aqueous layer. So the remaining organic layer would be the ester itself. So the whole bunch of these are the ester products. Okay? Again, we will discard away the aqueous layer and we collect the, the crude product. Okay? So these are all the separation technique. We kick away all those um, chemical species that is contaminating the esters. Okay? And at the end, we have the purification step. So even you get the uh, Organic layer, which is the ester, it may still have some residual water. So we add the anhydrous calcium chloride to the ester to remove the residual water. And then we also filter off the drying agent and distill the filtrate. Okay? And the fraction that boils at around 77 degrees Celsius is the pure ester. Okay? So this is how we do the purification. We dry it and then um, to remove the water. And we also try to boil it to get the purest ester. Okay? So now this is the story. This are the case study. Now if you ask me, do we actually need to know the whole story in DSC? No. Um, they won't ask you to comprehend the whole, uh, the whole procedures. It's too complicated. Uh, what I'm trying to do is, using these two uh, case study, I want you to uh, try to understand how we can carry out a preparation. Okay, you see the very important three stages, reaction, separation, purification. And I also want you to uh, pay attention to how we can apply solvent-solvent extraction when it comes to separation. And how we may add a base, a carbonate, to remove something. Okay, sometimes we need to uh, make use of some acid-based uh, behavior to remove some of the uh, uh, byproducts or, or contaminants. Okay. Now, uh, next page. Percentage yield. So, after all this process, the reaction, the separation, purification, there are so many steps, right? So you can expect to see from each step there is a chance where our product, our reactant, are uh, gone, uh, missing. Uh, pour away or maybe evaporated, something like that. So at the end, very often we have less product than we expected, less product than we calculated from mole calculation. That is perfectly normal. So here, the percentage yield always lower than 100%. Now the percentage yield is calculated by the actual mass of the product, okay, the mass of the product that you can get after all those procedures. And the theoretical mass of the product, this one you calculate it by mole calculation. And you multiply by 100%, then you will know the percentage yield, okay? And uh, the percentage yield is always lower than 100% because some of the reactant and product is lost. So here, these are some uh, possible reason why the percentage yield is always lower. Psi reaction, okay, the process the reaction may include a side reaction, uh, incomplete reaction, just like the esterification, it is never complete because it's reversible, loss of product during solvent extraction, okay, so just now you see even I do the solvent extraction uh, with the, with the uh, hexane and aldehyde solution, you see the water layer is still brown in color, meaning that some aldehyde is still there. Similar idea, if your separation
procedures involve a liquid liquid extraction, there must be some product inevitably lost during the liquid liquid extraction. Okay? Uh, volatile organic reactant are product vaporized during transfer of chemicals. So uh, some of the reactants products are volatile. Esters are volatile. So just now we prepare esters, right? So some of the ester may be vaporized out. Okay? So that's why it's lower than 100 percent Now just one more remark. Uh, when you actually do your perhaps SBA experiments or your actual preparation, sometimes you will get more than 100 percent yield. Uh, more than 100 percent yield. Okay? How come? How come it would be more than 100 percent yield? That means the actual mass is higher than the theoretical mass. How could it be possible? Well, usually there is one reason, or maybe two. You will either miscalculate the theoretical mass, or your product is wet. It's not dry enough. Not dry enough. So the residual water inside contribute to the mass and makes it an overestimated mass. Okay? So if you encounter your percentage yield over 100%, I suggest you to uh, evaluate your calculation and also make sure your product is dry enough. Okay? So that's the idea. Now for the practice question, actually this one is based on the case study B, the second case study, which is to prepare an ester from ethanol and ethanol acid. Okay? Um, I suggest you to go through it yourself, at least to go over these procedures so you get to understand what is going on and then I will do the question together with you. Okay? So pause the video, have a look at those steps. Okay, so I suppose you understand what is going on, so let's have a look. So step one, write the chemical equation. So this is a very typical esterification. We have ethanol reacts with ethanol acid. Make sure you use reversible sign. Make sure you use reversible sign. Okay. To form the ester and water. Okay. Now, state the organic compounds present in the distillate collected after step two. So, step one is to do esterification. So, we want to find out what are the organic products in the distillate. Okay, after step two. Now, we need to distill the product. You should expect to get, uh, of course, our ester. The ester, okay. Better to put down the name of the ester. You also have the ethanol because the ester and the ethanol has a very close boiling point. And you also expect to have some ethanol acid, even though the boiling point is higher, but you may still expect to see some ethanol acid there. Okay? Because actually, you can tell from step three, we are removing the ethanol acid. So you can tell there should be some ethanol acid there. Okay? So three. Uh, organic products and then C explain how ethanol acid can be removed in step 3 so step 3 we are adding sodium carbonate in the separating funnel so of course we need to say that um, the ethanol acid reacts with sodium carbonate to form to form sodium ethane away okay which is water soluble okay which is water soluble Okay, so we will say 
SH3CONA will, will dissolve in the bottom aqueous layer and it is discarded. So that is the idea. You may also put down a chemical equation if you wish to substantiate your answer. Okay. Now, part D, separating funnel was used in both step 3 and step 4. So explain why the funnel must be vented several times during shaking. Now of course, uh, you will say, uh, since, okay, Pressure increases inside the funnel upon shaking. Okay. Venting releases the pressure. Okay. And prevents the cap from popping out. Now this is a little bit more comprehensive. You know, I always like to explain the things more thoroughly. So the pressure inside increases, inside the funnel increases upon shaking. So venting releases the pressure and prevent the cap from popping out. Now E. How to dry the crude ester in step 5? So you dry the crude ester by adding anhydrous well calcium chloride okay. and then you can say filter the solid and collect dried ester okay filter the solid and collect the dry ester okay now F 5.4 gram of ethyl ethanol weight was obtained and calculate the percentage yield of ethyl ethanol weight in this experiment now first of all uh, to calculate the percentage yield so the percentage yield is equal to the actual mass over the theoretical mass right times 100 percent so the actual mass is 5.4 grams so we did collect 5.4 grams over here but we need to know the theoretical mass so the theoretical mass we will assume the reaction goes completely and from 5 gram of ethanol, 5 gram of glacial ethanol acid. So we want to figure out uh, what is the theoretical mass of the ester. So uh, they are all in one-to-one -one ratio. And uh, ethanol and ethanol acid, if you check their molar mass, so ethanol is 46. The noble acid is 60, right? So which one is the limiting reagent? Of course, uh, you will expect to see the uh, ethanol acid being the uh, limiting reagent because it has fewer moles of ethanol acid. Okay, it has a fewer mole, fewer moles. So we can do five over 60. Okay, so this is the number of mole of uh, ethanol acid. Okay, one to one ratio, so you expect to see the same number of mole of ester. Let me put down the steps. So we do five gram divided by um, sixty multiplied by the molar mass of uh, ethyl ethanol weight. Ethyl ethanol weight is uh, is eighty eight, is it? 
7. Plus 16 times 2 plus um, plus 8, right? Okay? Should be 8, right? 63 C O O 6263. Okay, correct. So 88. So times 100 percent. Okay. So you got this one as the denominator. This is the denominator. Okay, just put it down. 5.4 over 7.33 times 100 percent. So the answer is. 73.6%. That would be the percentage yield. Okay? Now, G. If step 5 was skipped, explain how would this affect the percentage yield of ethyl ethanoate. Now, what is step 5? Step 5 is the drying part. The drying part. If you forgot to dry it, then how would the percentage yield be affected? So, if this is not dried, uh, if you skip step 5, if you don't dry it and you, are, you go distillation, so your product may also contain some water. So, your product will be wet. In other words, will be wet. So, if your product is wet, when you weigh the wet product, it will be heavier than it's supposed to be. So actually, uh, the percentage yield, okay, the yield increases, okay, because some residual water, okay, uh, stay together with the product which uh, leads to an overestimated okay, mass of ester produced. Okay. But of course, even the percentage yield has increased it. It does not actually have more ester, it's just the water added inside. Okay. So that's the idea. Okay. All right. So um, that's it for the preparation part. Okay. Now, but before I stop the video, there is another technique that I want to introduce, uh, which is called suction filtration. Suction filtration. So um, I actually show you the demonstration first, and then I will jot down some uh, some key points, okay? So, hold on. Let's see, now this is what we did. So we don't need it anymore. Let's get rid of it. Okay, this time we need to also firm the sink, okay? It is related to the sink as well. Okay, so so this one is what we call suction filtration. So basically, it has the same uh, function as filtration, but it is better, and I'll explain it later. Now, first of all, we have this large uh, suction flask. Basically, it's a large conical flask, but there is a outlet here connected to. Uh, rubber tubing and this rubber tubing is connected to this we call this one a suction pump a suction pump uh, this suction pump is used to create a semi vacuum uh, that can provide a suction force to the filtration now how does it work uh, first of all we need to connect the suction pump into the water outlet okay so we connect it like this Okay. And actually, you see, if I turn on the water, okay, oh, 
không đó Ok, it may be best if you look at it this way Ok, can you see it? So, basically, you see the water falls through this pipe and then it goes out from this outlet Can you see it? So the water is coming out from here Now, remember, the water flows from here down to here and it is, it is going out The water never gets into here, never gets into here Okay. So the idea is a little bit about physics When you have the water flowing very quickly from here to here It will actually generate a lower pressure at this part So the pressure here is lower than the pressure inside inside the flask It's lower than the pressure inside the flask So that it creates a semi-vacuum Where it is sucking the air towards um, the suction pump So this is the idea about the suction pump okay? So right now the suction pump is uh, still working Still working here Right So the water going out Okay Now And then we will have this one Now this one is called A butcher funnel A butcher funnel Okay You see There is some little pores Okay At the bottom of this butcher funnel Okay and there is a rubber bump where we insert it here to this uh, suction flask like this now make sure this is tightly sealed now at this moment you can check to see if the vacuum is actually working by pressing your hand here you should be feeling some uh, suction force okay going on on your palm on your palm okay if you feel the force, that means it is fine, it is working properly Okay Now, of course, we want to do a filtration, we need to have a filter paper Of course, we are not simply relying on this pore This pore is not going to filter anything So, we need to have filter papers Now, this filter paper is different from what we have uh, seen before This filter paper it is much smaller, it's much smaller and it is designed exclusively to fit into this uh, butcher funnel so you see, it fits perfectly okay so after that, usually we will add some water uh, onto the filter funnel okay we will add some water hold on So this is uh, some distilled water Usually we will add some water to wet the filter paper so that it sticks firmly to the butcher funnel Okay Now you see some liquid is falling off so the, fill, the suction filtration uh, works and uh, you may see now the filter paper has uh, stuck to the bottom of the butcher funnel so let's just say assume this is uh, something that I want to filter then basically we just pour it on top like this okay just pour it on top and then it will carry out the filtration now you may ask hey, what is the what, what? Why do we have to use this suction filtration? Why don't we just use a um, uh, simple filtration like using a, a, a filter funnel, just like what we did in Form One or Form Three? Now the advantage of this one is that it filters much faster. It filters much faster, and also 
You see, if you do gravitation filtration, you never get the filtrate okay falling that fast. Okay, now this is the first advantage, which is faster. Another advantage is because it it is a pump, so they keep drawing the air uh, passing through the filter paper, so it it actually makes the uh, residue here drier than uh, the, the typical filtration. Okay, so um, that's why such a filtration is often used in organic synthesis because um, usually organic compounds are volatile, so we want it to uh, dry faster. Plus, um, we want to have our organic product dry. So if you do a suction filtration, the product here is drier than a typical filtration, so it takes lesser time to put it into an oven for drying, something like that. Okay? So that's the idea. This is the suction filtration. Okay? Let's go back to the notes. Now, uh, I want to make use of the last page. And you see, uh -huh, I have drawn beautiful diagrams of the suction filtration before. So, uh, yeah, you may, you may copy it, or, you know, I'm not really good at drawing, so you can have even better drawings. Uh, see if you can uh, recognize those parts. So, like, this is the sink, right? This is the sink. This is the, the water tap. Uh, this is the, the suction pump. The suction pump, and we say that the water kind of flow from here, okay, to here, and then go away, and then it generates uh, the vacuum here. This is the rubber tubing to the uh, suction flask. This is the butcher funnel, okay, and then we pour the mixture down to the butcher funnel. And you know the butcher funnel, there are holes at the bottom, but we actually put filter paper on top. Okay? So yeah, see if you want to uh, copy this or you want to draw your own version. Okay. You can pause the video and, and copy. Now uh, let me just fill in those uh, labels. Starting from here. So this is what we call uh, a suction pump. And basically, we try to okay create a semi vacuum here. Okay, a semi vacuum here inside the suction pump. Okay, and then here, this is the suction flask. It doesn't really matter. Now, the suction flask here, the the fill tray. Usually, we don't want it. We don't want the fill tray. When you do such a filtration, what we want is the residue. What we want is the residue on top of the filter paper. Okay? So this, this one is the butcher funnel. I forgot how to start butcher funnel. Hold on, let me check. This is not really an English word. Ah, Buchner funnel. So, Buchner funnel. Okay, is it a German word? I don't know. Butcher funnel. And here we actually put a filter paper. Okay. Right on top of those pores, and this is our um, mixture to be filtered. Okay, so that's the idea. Uh, the advantage we will put down here: advantage of suction filtration. One. Okay, dry faster. Ah, sorry, filter faster. Filter faster. Or faster filtration. Another one is okay, the residue is drier. Okay. So 
but these are the two advantages of performing a suction filtration. Actually, in probably one of our SPA, we need to use this uh, suction filtration. So it would be best if you know how to set it up. Okay. So I think that's it for today, and uh, see you guys later in the next video. Bye bye.